Thanks for listening to this Institute of Art and Ideas podcast, bringing you philosophy for our times. Here at the IAI, we're committed to taking philosophy out of dusty books and lecture halls and into the heart of public life. If you enjoy this debate and want to carry on the discussion, or watch over a thousand more debates and talks on all the latest issues in philosophy, science, politics and arts, visit iai.tv. Remember to subscribe and review on iTunes. If you talk about experience, people will refer to it in CV terms. You know, what's your experience? Tell us a bit about your experience. It can just refer to the things you've done. Uh, but we're going to be looking at it in a slightly more, I guess, philosophical way, you know, experience, the nature of experience, what it, what it is to experience things, how we are in the world, uh, how we process experience, whether it re remains mysterious or not, whether we can subject all of experience to scientific or philosophical methods, or indeed whether there'll be aspects of experience which will always elude our capacity to, to grasp it. So our official topic is experience. I don't know what experience is, but I'm inclined to take experience as a synonym for what I call consciousness. The reason I do that is I know something about consciousness. Um, experience, who knows? But um, consciousness, you know, there's a, there's a very good definition of consciousness, which I like. It's a, that annoying time between naps. Um, <laughs> there's that time when you're actually having subjective experiences of the world, unlike, say, when you're, when you're asleep or at least not dreaming. I mean, if I, if, if I was asked to define consciousness, we don't actually end up going in a tight circle. My favorite, de if I was given an official definition of consciousness, I'd say it's the subjective experience of the mind and of the world. So notice there, I used the word experience right there. And I think the crucial thing about this notion of experience is it's subjective experience. It's experience from a subjective point of view. Experience from a first person point of view. When I look out at this audience right now, I see all of you, I think I'm naturally said to have visual experiences. Subjectively, it's like something for me to see you. There are uh, colors and there are, there are shapes. This is a visual experience. There's something it's like for me to see. I'm having auditory experiences. There's something it's like for me to hear. There's something it's like to feel my body. I'm having proprioceptive experiences. There's something it's like for me to think, to remember. So I think of this as all sort of some massive multi-stream movie, if you, if you like, if you don't, don't take that metaphor too seriously. Experience is basically what it's like to have a mind from the first person point of view. And the big mystery is, I, mean, I think this is the most important phenomenon in the world as far as I'm concerned. It's not just because I make my living thinking and, uh, and writing about it. I think experience is what gives our life meaning. It's what gives our life value. You know, if, it, if we weren't experiencing creatures, our lives would, be, in an important sense, I think, be meaningless and, uh, and valueless. But at the same time, we don't understand how this phenomenon fits in to our scientific picture of the world. Our picture of the world is almost, our scientific picture of the world is largely objective. It's mechanisms, one thing after another. The neuron causes a neuron, which sends a signal, which causes an action. We've got a beautiful scientific picture of that. But where does subjective experience fit in? It looks like you can tell the whole story about the brain without mentioning conscious experience. So hopefully today, in the next hour or so, we're going to figure out the answer. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we are. Um, thanks, David. I'll, I'll move on to Susanna in a second. Just a quick follow-up. Um, you said right at the beginning, it, you know, uh, experience is, is like consciousness, the annoying thing that happens between naps. So you're bringing together experience and consciousness pretty, clearly, uh, pretty closely. So, so is the notion of unconscious experience impossible? I think there can be, for example, unconscious perception. I mean, it's clear there are, there are cases where someone is exposed to a certain stimulus, doesn't report seeing anything, but it still affects their action. And we sadly call that unconscious perception. I would not myself call that an experience, precisely because it doesn't feel like anything from the inside. This is, to some extent, verbal, what you're going to call an experience, but I reserve the word experience for something that feels like something subjectively. And if it does that, then in my view, it's also conscious. Um, I see in the, in the briefings that uh, I'm supposed to have the position that experience is in the material world. Now, I'm not a philosopher, so I don't exactly know what the material world is, 
but uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to rephrase that as uh, saying that uh, experience is uh, generated in the brain and the brain is part of the physical universe, obeys natural laws, and so uh, I believe that uh, we're not there yet, but eventually we're going to be able to be able to explain experience in terms of uh, neuroscience. And uh, one of the limitations of our experience, and actually one of the strengths that we have, one of the tools that we have to approach the study of experience from a neuroscientific point of view, is that experience does not match reality. What do I mean by that? Every feeling, every memory, every color we see, every sound we hear, this is mediated by our neural hardware and software, and, but it doesn't have to match. If we're talking about the sense of sight, we may see something that is not there, or we may fail to see something that is there. More generally, we may see something different from what is there. So our experience can be, can be different. It's going to depend on what the brain is doing. And if you remember the movie The Matrix, there's a quote that I like. This is Morpheus talking to Neo. And he says, what is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can sense and see, what you can touch and feel, then real is simply electrical impulses interpreted by the brain. Now, this, this is true. I remember thinking, well, they, they got it right. What we feel and see and touch, this is the product of electrochemical activity in our brains. Now, with the, with the movie, the problem of Neo in the movie is that, of course, he has this very dire situation because uh, he is being used by a battery, by the machine overlords, and not all the science in the movie made perfect sense. The battery part was, was one uh, important uh, point that uh, was, wasn't so scientific. However, the same thing happens to us that we know it happens to us in our dreams. Neo doesn't know he's in the matrix. We don't know that we are in our dreams because to our brain, we are experiencing reality. The reality of the, of the dream is real to us. And what the movie doesn't tell you is that when Neo wakes up from the matrix and when we wake up from our dreams, every thought, every sensation, every feeling is still the product of neural activity in our brains. So we are always imprisoned in this matrix that our brains create. We live in a simulation of reality. I'm going to assume, for the purpose of this discussion, that there is a real world, and this is not completely uh, accepted, but I'm going to assume there is a real world, but you've never lived there. You haven't been there even for a visit. We live in our brain's matrix. And, and this matrix may or may not match reality, as I was saying. We call the cases in which the discrepancy is largest, we call them illusions. But it is very rarely the case that we have 100% correspondence. And uh, so we can say that uh, most of our experience, perhaps all of our experience, is to a degree, to a partial degree, illusory. And that is both a limitation in a sense, but also gives us a tool to approach the study of experience from neuroscience. I was asked to answer the question, or to give a short spiel on the question of whether experience is part of the material world. And to anyone with a nose for nonsense, this question smells very bad indeed. It would be easier to smell a rat than to catch one, but I shall try. Uh, the question, I think, is at best misleading with a trivial answer, or at worst nonsense, and to a question which makes no sense. There can't be an answer or no clarification. Now, the beginning of wisdom in philosophy in general is to learn not to rush in to answer questions, but first to ask questions of the questions. Now, of course, this is an art which is a great irritant to many, as the patron saint of philosophy, Socrates, found to his cost. I trust there's no hemlock around here. So the question was, is experience a part of the material world? The material world as opposed to what? Uh, we speak of the world of politics or the world of economics. So is experience part of the world of matter as opposed to being part of the world of politics? Rubbish. So what is meant by the world of? Well, the world of economics is the sphere of interest and concern to economics. Is the material world, the world of matter, the sphere of interest for the sciences of matter, namely physics and the physical sciences? Now, if that is what is meant, then of course it's painted that physics does not study human experience, nor should we expect it to. It doesn't study the world of economics either, and we shouldn't expect it to. Okay. 
What exactly is the world? Is it everything that is the case? Well, perhaps. But if so, experience is not part of the world, and experience is not a part of what is the case. Indeed, the very phrase, the very sentence, experience is part of what is the case, doesn't even make sense. So is the world then not everything that is the case, but rather the totality of things? Well, perhaps, but experiences are certainly not things. So, so far, we don't get very far. So let's pause a little and think, what on earth is experience? Now, the question of what an experience is, like the question of what a thing is, is extraordinarily unhelpful. It intimates an answer of a form that isn't available, namely, an experience is a something, or a thing is a something, and there is no answer of that general form. What you can ask is, how is the word experience used? And uh, it does indeed have respectable uses which can be elaborated, and Robert mentioned a few to start with. We can have enjoyable or unpleasant experiences. Uh, that means uh, incidents, episodes, happenings. We can experience uh, suffering or ha harassment or distress. And experience there means an undergoing, uh, uh, um, an enduring, a putting up with. We can speak of having one's first experience of, say, falling in love being exposed to, being involved in, participating in, becoming acquainted with something. Perfectly decent. We talk about gaining experience, acquiring skills. We say somebody has a great deal of experience, a skillful professional practice, possesses practical knowledge. We learn things by or from experience as opposed to coming to know them by reasoning alone or by intuition. And we speak of the triumph of hope over experience. Now all these are perfectly decent uses. Experiences, roughly speaking, are the doings and undergoings of human beings. Human beings are spatio-temporal, material, animate denizens of the world, as it were. But that doesn't make experiences denizens of the world any more than they are parts of it. To fall happily in love for the first time, to be sure, is to have a joyous experience. Is falling in love part of the material world? Is fear? Is joy? What on earth is that supposed to mean? Do you mean, do people fall in love? Well, yes, of course they do. Do you mean, are people sometimes fearful or joyful? Yes, of course they are. Now, these answers are trivial, and really, they just make fun of the question. It's the nominal experience that is confusing. It is a substantive, and substantives induce us to search for substances to correspond to them. And if we can't find any, we declare that there's a mystery, that what corresponds to them is singularly mysterious. But actually, there are no mysteries in philosophy, only mystifications. Now, less confusion is generated if we speak of experiencing and of ex specific experiences such as falling in love. Now, the question, the questions, is, experiences, ex is, is experiencing a part of the material world is patently a silly question, or is falling in love a part of the material world is patently an equally silly question. So what we need to do here is to treat the question, is experience of this or that, uh, uh, as a form of intellectual aberration. And we will notice, if we do so, that experiences aren't properties of the brain. If they're properties of anything, they're properties of human beings. So experiences are neither part of the material world nor not a part of the material world. Thank you. The debate. Theme one. What we want to look at is not just what experience is, but why there might still be something mysterious about it. So you were talking about experience as subjective and conscious. Does that suggest or not that there can still be things that are mysterious in it? Can you, have a, can you be fully conscious of something which remains mysterious? Yeah, well, I think in some sense, consciousness, experience, is the thing which we know more directly than we know anything in the world. I certainly seem to have very direct and immediate knowledge of my experience, my visual experience right now, a feeling of pain and so on, but still at the level of understanding and explanation, I think it's extremely mysterious. So I would, uh, I, mean, I would prefer to raise these questions in the key of explanation. I mean, I agree with Peter that if you ask the question, is experiencing part of the material world, it's at the very least ambiguous and unclear uh, what the content of that is. For me, the, the real question is, how can we explain 
experience, the experiences we have and the fact that we're experiencing now. And in particular, if you're going to raise that in the key of science, can you explain let our me, experiencing uh, in physical terms? Let me stop you right on that. You said what you're experiencing now. What are you experiencing now? Many things. I'm experiencing a, a certain feeling in the, in the bottom of my, of my foot and my bum on the, on the seat. I'm experiencing... Um, I'm seeing you right now, I'm having a visual experience of you and of the, the floor and of my hand. I'm hearing the sound of my own voice droning on and on. And what's the, what's the problem with any of that, if any? Why is there any such thing? Why is there any experience? How, and in particular, can any of that be explained in wholly physical terms? The natural place to look is in terms of my brain. There's a whole bunch of processes in my brain, and you can tell quite a lot, for example, about the process whereby the eye sends signals to the visual cortex, send signals throughout the brain, but does any of that explain why it is that I'm in fact visually experiencing, that there's a certain subjective quality from the first right. person? So you can say that it's the case, you can't say why it's the case. That's right, yeah. Um, at least certain kinds of explanation, those in terms of neuroscience, for example, seem at least to be, those wholly in terms of neuroscience seem to be incomplete. That leaves open whether there are other explanations. Maybe there are historical or psychological explanations. I'm experiencing this because I looked over there and, uh, and there you were. And of course, I saw you, but that's kind of presupposing that I have the capacity yeah. for experience. The very fact of it in the first place is not explained. And let's pick up on this notion that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the explanations of neuroscience are incomplete because it clearly goes back to what you were saying earlier, Susanna. And I, I think what you were saying is, well, yes, the explanations of neuroscience might be incomplete right now because neuroscience has a bit further to go. But in principle, neuroscience could explain everything. And that would be, is that something you would s continue to disagree with, even if Susanna and her discipline were to evolve to a point where neuroscience could no longer be perfected anymore? Would it be for you the case, David, that you'd say that's still an insufficient explanation? We cannot... We cannot explain all of experience in neuroscientific terms. I'm actually I'm a big fan of neuroscience. I'm a big fan of the neuroscience of consciousness, which Susanna has contributed a lot to. But I think, at least at the moment, and maybe in principle, it's got certain limitations, which is it's basically a science of correlations. We find out, the, uh, for example, the processes in the brain which are active when someone's having an experience, say, of a certain color or of a certain shape or of a certain going on in their... Um, in their visual field, and it's at a level, really, the science, at least recently, has been at a level of correlations. The project has been to look for the neural correlate of consciousness, or the NCC, as some people talk of, which has nice Star Trek overtones, for those of you who remember the Enterprise, which was NCC 1701, looking for the, uh, the neural correlate of consciousness. We're about, what we want to get to is explanation. And I think my view is that really what we need to do is the neuroscience is always going to it's great for explaining certain things, behaviors and functional responses, things on the objective side. But to get to the objective side, I think somehow you need to assume some kind of bridging principle that links you from the objective to the subjective. And if you do that, and people have got some interesting proposals out there right now, including neuroscientists who have theories that link neuroscience to the subjective, then neuroscience plus such a bridging principle might give you some explanation of consciousness. But neuroscience on its own, I think, is not going to do it. Bit too much correlation, bit too little explanation, Susanna. Well, uh, I, I would start by, by saying there's a, a few different points I would make. Uh, first off, about the why. Can neuroscience solve the why? Why is a question for philosophers. Uh, the question that neuroscience tries to answer is how. And those are different questions, because it may be that there is no why. Why should we be that we're conscious? Or the answer, the answer can be why not? So we are conscious beings, and the question that interests me is how does that happen? How is it possible that you put a bunch of neurons on a plate and that uh, they're connected to each other and you have the right neurotransmitters and uh, they're alive, they're, they're firing, but they're not conscious or we assume they're not conscious. And these same neurons, you grow them up to the size of a brain and that uh, it makes you feel that you are who you are. Um, I would argue that um, however that happened, it is in the brain that we are generating consciousness or, uh, or what I would also call perception, our perception of events in the world and our events uh, in ourselves. And can neuroscience explain it now? No, we can't. But neuroscience is a very young discipline. We are like, 
whatever, a few, a few decades old if you talk about cognitive neuroscience. So I think that we have to give neuroscience a chance and that uh, even if we talk about the visual system, that's uh, the area of neuroscience in which I received my, my initial training. We have over two dozen areas in the brain that process visual information. We know very well how maybe the first three or so work. And even then, every year, we're learning something new about those areas that we thought that we knew and were continuously making discoveries about experience that are puzzling. And if I may do a little experiment here, do you all remember the infamous dress? If I can have a show of hands, who saw it as white and gold? And who saw it as black and blue? It's about half and half. Now, we know there are theories. People have started publishing papers and addressing this phenomenon in the laboratory. And it turns out that uh, the, the two color combinations, yellow and uh, white versus black and blue, there was something critical about these colors for evolutionary reasons. We can get into that later. But uh, so we have explanations for that that appear sensible. What we don't have any clue about is why half of humanity is seeing one call versus the other. Up until now, it was kind of a thought experiment for philosophers to, to ponder, well, why is it that, uh, could, could it be that what I'm calling red, you're seeing as blue, but we're, you're, you're calling it the same thing, and that uh, this was something like fun to think about for neuroscientists, but never really, nobody really paid so much attention, I don't think. But now with the dress, this turns around a few of our assumptions. We used to think that uh, we all have brains that are similar to each other, we think, in terms of the major functional anatomy, the gross functional anatomy, so we should have similar experiences. But here we have a completely new color illusion that reveals fundamental individual differences in experience that we cannot explain at the stage we're at. But, but I'm very optimistic that we will at some point. Okay, so that's helpful. You said your job is the how rather than the why, and I'll ask uh, Peter in a second more about the, the why question. But I, just, I have to pick up on something, because uh, just yesterday I was on this stage in a debate on a different subject, but we did, during that debate, talk a lot about intuition, for example. So when you said, and I'm going to caricature a little bit, but when you said we only ever experience things in the brain, I couldn't help thinking, well, what about gut experience, for example? Do you have any tolerance for explanations like that? Do we experience things in the gut or do we not? In the what? In the gut, gut feeling. Oh, in the gut, but that's, that's uh, also connected to a nervous system. So yeah. the experience, I don't believe, and that uh, we have a lot of neurons in our gut. In fact, we have as many neurons uh, or nearly as in our brain. The, the gut is referred to as the second brain, but I don't think that the gut itself is conscious. I may be wrong, but my assumption, I think the most parsimonious explanation is that my gut doesn't have a consciousness of its own, and that when I have a tummy ache, I feel that because of my central nervous system in my brain. And what about intuition? That's part of my central nervous system too. Okay. <laughs> Peter, this question of the why, I suppose, rather than well, the how, I can you help us formulate a good question around this? Well, I think it's a model. Of course, science explains why things happen. It explains a vast range of things happening, whether it's the solar system or um, nuclear reactions or the uh, why when you suffer, uh, I don't know, damage to the frontal cortices, such and such forms of behaviour result. Science, of course, explains why things happen as well as how things happen. Uh, what philosophy does is to clarify conceptual structures and dissolve conceptual puzzlements. Now, I think it's quite false to say that the brain experiences anything. The brain is not an organ of experience although you can't have experience without the brain, but you can't walk without the brain, and the brain is not an organ for walking. Everything we do depends upon the functioning of the brain. That doesn't mean that the brain is an organ for everything we do. Um, David is uh, very much taken with the thought that experience is the same as consciousness. I don't myself think that's true. Uh, and equally taken with the thought that experience is something subjective. Now, if subjective means experience is of a subject, it is subjects, human beings, that have experiences, then, of course, I agree completely. But David claimed that for every experience, there is something which it is like to have it. And I think that's mistaken. Now, reflect briefly on the thought that uh, I can ask you, you know, what was it like to attend a meeting at this uh, place? 
You say, oh, it was fascinating, marvellous, exciting. Fine. What was it like to have an operation for such and such malady? Oh, it was awful. What was it like to look at the button on my shirt? Nobody knows how to answer. I mean, it's not like him. What's it like to walk down the streets and as you walk past the third lamppost to see the lamppost? What's that like? What are you supposed to answer? The answer is you're not supposed to answer anything because the question, what is it like, is a request for an affective characterization of what you're doing or undergoing. Namely, is it pleasant? Is it nice? Is it awful? Is it appalling? Is it terrible? Fascinating. Now, if that presupposition is violated, if there's no effective character to whatever it is you're seeing, hearing, doing, and so on, then the question is out of place. For the vast majority of the, our seeings, hearings, doings, participatings, and so on, there is no, it isn't like anything for us to in, undergo them, because it ha the experience has no affective character. Now, David jumped from the, from the point that for every experience, uh, one can ask, uh, what's it like to have it? You jump from that to saying, well, there is something which it is like to have it. I put it to you, a rather uh, pedantic point, that that phrase is not actually English. It looks as if it is, but let me explain to you why it isn't. I can ask you what it's like to uh, um, see a wonderful uh, opera or see a wonderful performance of Hamlet. And you say, it's it's wonderful. Now you, can, you don't say it's like wonderful except in California. <laughs> right? So seeing this remarkable performance was wonderful. So there is something which it is to see that experience, namely wonderful. Not like wonderful. Right? So there is something it is to uh, see a beautiful painting, life enhancing. There is something which it is to undergo an operation for cancer. Awful. But in general, you can't characterize all the possible doings and undergoings and seeings and hearings by reference to their having an affective character, because most of them have no affective character at all, which is just as well, because if they did, we'd be swamped with awfulnesses and pleasantnesses. Theme two. Well, this idea of awfulnesses and pleasantnesses is interesting because the kind of uh, the basic terms of this discussion this afternoon is that we're trying to understand experience through philosophical and or neuroscientific lenses, and that's, that kind of represents the experience and the expertise of the panel here. But of course, uh, philosophy and neuroscience are not the only ways in which we can understand experience. There are plenty of other ways too. So I'm going to ask the panel to, to, to reflect on, for example the experience of uh, reading a novel or looking at a painting or, uh, or seeing a play, as Peter just talked about, and whether there are ways in which, for example, art and literature are uh, more accurate, if you can use that term, or uh, more trustworthy or more familiar ways of capturing what experience is, even than the best possible philosophical explanation or the best possible neuroscientific explanation because clearly we can have neuroscientific up to a point and we can have philosophical uh, explanations up to a point of what experience is. But the question really is kind of how satisfactory are those? So I want to come back to you again, uh, David, on that. What about the relative merits of alternative ways of capturing, reflecting, accounting for experience, which aren't necessarily either philosophical or neuroscientific? Yeah, but this does partly... Does this is partly a question of how to describe or characterize experiences or experiencing, which is notoriously hard. You know, we don't have, we have a, you know, there is a distinctive character, say, for example, to seeing the color red, but how would you characterize that? Well, just by its relations to other things, you know, the color of a flower, the color of a certain flower, or it's different from certain other colors, but that's these are very inarticulate descriptions. And the same goes for even, you know, more complex visual experience. I think there is, for example, something it's like to see a painting, something it's like for me to look out at the crowd right now. I think part of that is affective. We do say, you know, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but it also has a certain distinctive visual subjective character. So that, for example, we can quite reasonably say someone who's, um, who's colorblind doesn't know what it's like to see red, meaning they, they just don't know that particular subjective character of redness. So here is, I think, a place where uh, 
where, for example, the visual arts can certainly help in capturing some of the, you know, the distinctive character. I don't know about what it's like to see red, but say the distinctive character of seeing, which you know, we naively tend to think is, well, it's, a very, it's just a very rich image and it's equally detailed all the way out. And so, well, it turns out vision is not like that. It's the science reveals that vision is not uh, you know, equally determinate all the way out. It's detailed here, but then it falls off. So you might see what goes on in various artistic movements, such as, say, the, uh, the Impressionists as trying more accurately to capture some of the subjective character of actually seeing, roughly. It's a whole lot more impressionistic than you might have thought. And the first time people did this, um, they, people saw impressionist paintings, they were shocked. And the second time, it was like, hey, that's actually getting at something about our experience, something which has maybe in part become vindicated by the, uh, by the science. I think this is absolutely a case where you might see an artistic medium, in this case, painting as a tool for expressing and characterizing certain aspects of the subjective quality of experience. And of course, literature is another. Proust has given some of the most marvelous phenomenological descriptions of experience that anyone's ever given in extraordinary detail. And you know, I've never seen a, with all respect to the scientists working on this stuff, you know, I've never seen a, a scientist or a, an analytic philosopher's characterization of experience that runs anywhere near as deep as the characterizations of Proust or Monet. Well, let me, let me pick up on that. I mean, say we want to understand the experience of fear or terror. So I'll, I'll put this question to you, Susanna. Why aren't we better off actually watching a movie like Silence of the Lambs than reading the outputs of your research or indeed the outputs of uh, Peter's or Davies? Why, why, why wouldn't we just go and see the movie? That we all know exactly what that experience of uh, fear or terror is. Why is that, no, no, why is that worse than, than coming to your research? Well, I, I, before I answer that specific question, I, I want to follow up on the, on the point that uh, they were just making. And I, I'm also a big believer in the possibility for collaboration between the sciences and the arts. And in my own research, I have studied uh, paint, visual art pa painters as well as stage magicians because uh, these different fields that you, in principle, would think have nothing to do with science, especially if you're interested in perception and in illusory perception or illusory experience. Uh, these fields, the, the arts, have been doing this for millennia, whereas cognitive neuroscience is very young in comparison. But uh, these disciplines, uh, Impressionism, for instance, in my own research, uh, the op artist, the uh, op art short for optical art, they were playing with illusory perception as the subject of their art. And they were doing research. They may not have used the scientific method per se, but they were doing research and learning, sometimes through trial and error, what works, what doesn't. So I think that you can make significant discoveries and generate theories about the brain, whether you're a scientist or an artist or, or even a philosopher. And, that, uh, and certainly from artists, uh, if you're doing research, I don't, I don't care if you have a PhD or not. So there's a great potential for, for collaboration. And why doesn't uh, science uh, generate a horrific experience or uh, a beautiful experience? That's not what science is trying to do. Science is trying to come up with an explanation of the how. It's not eliciting it now. But I think, but, but the, through, but I think the question is... I, but what I w surely I understand uh, terror much more directly by watching a, t a horror movie than I do by... But, but through electrical stimulation in your brain, I could produce that experience of terror, <laughs> and that would be a science-induced experience. Mm -hmm. Or I could produce through electrical stimulation in a different part of the brain, in, mm -hmm. the, in, the, in the occipital lobes, I could produce a visual experience. Yes. So, but you're, not going, to, you're yes. not going to read that in a paper. The paper is trying to do something else. It's sure. communicating a discovery. But yeah. science itself can generate this powerful experiences, just as uh, art can. Mm. Peter, how would you r respond to this, this question of uh, alternative understandings of the nature of experience and how compatible they are or not with a philosophical well, understanding, a scientific understanding? Uh, as I remarked, the best thing we can do to start with is just put the word experience aside and just use examples. The word experience is, is as dangerous as the word property. You want to know and the word property in the sense of a quality of an object. Right? It's an invitation to confusion. Now, there are lots of things to understand about seeing, watching, observing, gazing, glimpsing. 
and the neuroscientists are doing their best and they've made great advances. There's an awfully long way to go, as you've rightly said. I, I myself think that neuroscience today stands to a future science of, of as a future neuroscience, as alchemy stands to modern chemistry. We're just at the beginnings, but we've done so far uh, quite well, and we're going in the right directions. I have no doubt about that at all. But neuroscience will never explain uh, some of the questions we have. Uh, it's not going to be uh, within the competence of neuroscience. Uh, to describe or explain adequately uh, what a young man or woman undergoes when they fall in love, or what is involved in loving another person. Uh, in order to under better to understand those phenomena of human life, you go to the great novelists and the great playwrights and the great poets of our culture, who can give you uh, pictures of human possibilities, uh, which is simply not the province of neuroscience to do, and certainly not the province of philosophy. The province of philosophy is conceptual clarification and the disentangling of conceptual confusion. So yes, there are different ways of understanding. Science is not the only way of understanding phenomena. No amount of science will explain why the Second World War started. Uh, no amount of science uh, uh, will explain um, uh, uh, why Beethoven's uh, Fifth Symphony is superior to the First Symphony, if it is, and so on and so forth. So there are all sorts of things we try to, ex to understand, all sorts of phenomena which we need explaining, and there isn't a unique form of explaining. There are different forms of explaining appropriate to different questions. Neurological questions are to be answered by neuroscience, and neuroscientific questions by neuroscience, but uh, historical questions are not, and there are whole ranges of other questions which are not. And for the understanding of the human heart, uh, we want to look above all to the great literary artists of our culture. Theme three. I guess sort of underlying this is the question of how valuable an explanation of experience is versus experiencing per se, and whether there is something about the nature of our explanation which cuts us off from experiencing. So if and we've talked about literature, for example, I was thinking a lot as you were talking, Peter, as you were talking as well, about the romantic poets writing in the late 18th century, uh, early 19th century in this, in this country. They talk a lot about the experience, for example, of the sublime. And what they're trying to insist on, I suppose, is that as soon as you try to explain that experience, you ruin it, essentially. So there is something about the effort at understanding, which itself is non-experiential you know, non or counter-experiential or is likely to impede or inhibit that experience. What would you say to that, David? When you analyse a joke, of course, that's no longer, it, it's no longer funny, but uh, it doesn't, you know, but look, the scientist of humour doesn't have to be funny. You know, it's like, let, the, let, let, let the comedians be funny and let the scientists study, uh, study humour. Um, you know, it's also, you know, biologists, just because a biologist is working on... Uh, is working on life and explaining life. It's not like they suddenly drop dead. You know, it's, it's, it's consistent with there's being alive, there's understanding life, and there's, uh, there's explaining life. Unquestionably, understanding anything changes your experience of that uh, phenomena. So a scientific or a philosophical understanding of experience, no doubt, will, to some, to some degree, change the experiences that we have. Like I suspect they're not going... You know, Philosophers can turn their philosophy off. Scientists can turn their philosophy off. I can go to the museum and right. look at a beautiful painting and still have the kind of experience that I might have had before I started doing philosophy. Presumably, you're still understanding even your, as, as you're experiencing, right? Um, yeah. Right. But, I mean, philosophy can deepen your, uh, or science can deepen, and on occasion does deepen your understanding, say, of a work of art, that case I mentioned with the, uh, with the Impressionists. But the fact is, it's not that hard to, yeah. to turn it off and let the music wash over you and, uh, and appreciate. I think there's just, there's the project of, I mean, there's experiencing, there's understanding and experience and appreciating it for what it is, and then there's theorizing about it and they're explaining it, and they're separate projects, each equally important. Okay, and quick word from the, uh, you, Susanna, and then you, Peter, on this, and before we open it out to the audience. Yeah, I'm not concerned about uh, knowledge ruining the experience. Um, the, this reminds me, I think it's kind of like um, a, unjustified fear. It reminds me of when I was starting to study the neuroscience of magic, and a lot of people were alarmed, especially magicians, and that, uh, well, if you are going to now explain how this all happens in the brain, and you're going to know the secrets of the magic tricks, 
it's, it's a magic going to be ruined for you. Now you know how magic works uh, in the brain and out. What's going to happen to your experience of magic? And what I found is that I actually enjoy magic a lot more now that I've studied it in my laboratory than before, before I wasn't that interested in magic. Okay, so not only not contradictory, but possibly complementary. Peter? I think you have to be a little bit careful again with the use of this infernal word experience. If you go to the... Um, say the stanza della segnatura and you see the school of Athens, a great and wonderful painting. So you can, no, you don't just see it, you have the experience of seeing it. And so now do you understand the experience? What you need to understand is the painting, not the experience of seeing it. The experience of seeing it is one thing, which is just a fancy way of seeing it. Uh, do you understand seeing it? No, I, I turn to Suzanne to ask uh, how to understand the seeing, and it doesn't matter whether it's the stanza della segnatura in the School of Athens or something else. But if, in order to understand what I'm seeing, what I'm experiencing, and in that sense of experience, then, among other things, I go to the great art historians, uh, I go to people like A.B. Warburg, who gives you an iconological analysis of the painting, and I will have explained to me that uh, this is Plato, and this is Aristotle, and this is Archimedes, and so on, and one is painting, uh, pointing upwards for this reason, and somebody is pointing downwards for that. Then I'll understand what I'm seeing very much better. I won't understand my seeing of it, but it's not clear what on earth is meant here in this context by understanding the seeing. Uh, I mean, you say, why am I seeing this? Well, because I came to the Stanza della Senoratura to see the great paintings. Now you understand why I'm seeing it. <laughs> Obviously, that's not what is asked. It's not clear that anything sensible is being asked in this context. And neuroscience is not going to have anything very informative to tell you about seeing the School of Athens. It may have a great deal to tell you about uh, visual, visual uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, color perception as opposed to uh, non-chromatic uh, uh, vision, uh, tell you a great deal about uh, seeing motion as opposed to, uh, and so on and so forth, but not about seeing a great work of art and understanding it. Thank you for listening to this Institute of Art and Ideas podcast. If you enjoyed this debate and want to carry on the discussion, visit iai.tv. Remember to subscribe and review on iTunes.